Hey, g'day, it's Brezzo. Welcome back to my workshop. Now I'm starting a new project today and I've got a new sticker to put up on the door. Now rather than just telling you the name of this person, I thought we'd have a bit of a game and do a quiz. So I've written down eight clues here and I'm going to start reading out the clues one after the other. When you think you know the name of this person, just sing out and we'll see how far we get. Now don't worry, I've got eight clues. We're going to get there eventually, okay? So here's the first clue. She has a home machine shop. Yeah. Blondia. Blondia. Yeah. Blondia. Oh, come on, look, I didn't even get through the first clue and there's, there's eight of them and everything. Hang on. Can you see through the back of that or something? Anyway, let's get up on the door. Yeah, you ruined that, didn't you? I think we're going to put Queen right at the top here. Got room up there for another row of stickers. So this one can go there. There's Queen up there, also known as Blondie Hacks. Now, she's got over 100,000 subscribers and has released around about 230, 240 videos. And she's currently working on a narrow gauge steam locomotive, a Pennsylvania switcher. And she's also done a number of stationary steam engines and a vertical boiler. So if you're into model engineering and you've got a, a modest home machine shop, you'll learn a lot by looking at what Quinn can do in her home machine shop. So uh, there's an excellent resource there. I'll put a link in the description below if you haven't seen her videos already. Uh, by the sound of things, everyone knows her. Anyway, let's look at today's project. Today's job is to make up a set of clamping hardware for this aluminium fixture plate. Now I made this up for my rotary table, but it can also bolt down directly to the bed of the milling machine. And I wanted to make up a set of the Mighty Byte style clamps. Now I saw a video by Clickspring. He had done the hexagonal style of uh, Mighty Byte clamp. And if you go on the Mighty Byte website, you can see all the different styles of clamps that they sell. And I would love to buy them, but getting them here in Australia would be outrageously expensive. So I decided to make my own. In the style that Clickspring had done, the he eccentric headed screw when it's tightened out, moves the hexagon laterally along the surface of the fixture plate. This style here is a little bit different. The brass jaw here is sitting on an angular face. So if I undo the screw here, you can see how that works. So this surface here slopes downwards at about 10 degrees, I think. And when you tighten the screw head, it will make that brass jaw slide laterally down the angular face and it puts side pressure on the part that you want to machine but it also applies some downward clamping force as well. So this isn't finished yet, these screws will need to be machined with an eccentric head on them and we'll do that later. But what I can do there is put a part into the steps that I've machined in these parts here and then when I tighten that screw it will clamp it between those uh, or between these two edges here and the brass jaw. So I'm going to be making up um, a, like a set of these. Uh, there will be two different stops with the steps in them. There will also be a plain stop which is with a square end on it like that. And there will also be a clamp that doesn't have the step that you can see here. The, the brass uh, jaw will just simply slide down that angular face and hold a part directly against the surface of the uh, fixture plate. So, quite a few different styles to make there. I've got drawings of all of these. And the whole reason I'm making this uh, side project here, which was the fixture plate and the clamps, is that I also started making one of the Hemingway sensitive knurling tools some time ago. And if you've seen Cloud42 and Inheritance Machining, they're both making the same tool. And I decided that it wasn't worth me doing a third <laughs> video series on the same tool. So uh, I just... Uh, went ahead and started making it myself. So I got to that point. Now, I stopped because all of the rest of the machining operations on these parts is to be done on the rotary table. And these arms in particular require quite a lot of tangent curves to be machined into it. And I figured that uh, it'd be instructional to do it on the rotary table since I haven't used it a lot and I'd like to learn how to use it well. So rather than just simply mark these out and just start filing or hacksawing, I figured that we do it on the rotary table. Now, I will show this tool when it's completed. Uh, you'll probably see it pop up in other videos and I'll probably put up some uh, uh, pictures on Instagram as well. 
but that's why uh, that project is stopped and I need to get on and do this one. Now the material I'm using today is just hot roll steel. Why? Well, because I had it and also it's, uh, you know, it's cheap. If I was working in a commercial workshop and we were doing high speed CNC machining, you'd probably want to have some high quality tool steel and you'd want to get it hardened and ground. But for me, as a hobbyist, it's going to be fine. So I've just cut this up into convenient sized lumps. Uh, the next step is going to be to get over to the bridge port and start squaring up the stock. I'll just briefly show you how I'm doing that, but there's no point in going through every single step. Then we'll get back to the more interesting machine processes later. In order to square up these lumps of material, I'm going to machine off the sawn faces. So that's this top face here and this underside here. And I'm going to leave the material at its original thickness when it was cut from the bar stock. And they will become the sides of the clamps later. Uh, those faces don't need to be any particular dimension or terribly square, but the top and bottom face do need to be accurate. So I'm going to put these in the vise. They're sitting on a pair of parallels. They're separated by a leaf spring, so they're always pushing out against the faces of the jaws. And you can do two at a time as long as you use something like a piece of copper rod or a strip of copper sheet, fairly thick piece of copper, in order to allow for any discrepancy in the dimensions across those faces there. So the copper will squish into this surface here and keep it from moving if they're slightly different. So I'm going to go ahead now and machine the top surface of each one and then we'll flip them over and then machine them all to a finished dimension. I'm using a three insert face mill to do this. I have machined all of these now on one side. So there's one machine face, there's one sawn face there. What I need to do now is bring these to a finished thickness of 16 millimeters. So I've put a pair of them with the machine face down on the parallels and knocked that down. I've got the copper rod in there again. And I've just cleaned up that face. Now that's still oversized. So I'm gonna measure that now with the micrometer, work out what the difference is. We'll set that on the DRO and I can machine them all down to zero on the DRO. So you can see here I thought ahead for a change <laughs> and I've got one end of this sticking out so I can get the micrometer on it and it should be close to 16. So I've got 16.63 and a bit. So I'm going to set that on the DRO now, set the difference and then we'll just bring it back to zero. Let me check that again. Instantly, these don't need to be accurately sized on the thickness. If we get them within a couple of thou, we're good. So 16.63, yeah, that'll do. So I'll take off 0.63. So on my filthy touch DRO screen here, we can just simply press and hold on Z, and then you can enter the distance that you want to travel. So in this case, we want to put 0 0.63, done. And now when I lower the, well, no, when I raise the knee, this is going to come back to zero. Okay, see how we went. 
So we're about 200 oversized, so it's less than a thou. I actually reset the Z to account for that 200 of a millimeter, and that's going to allow me to clean these up on my surface grinder. <laughs> my manual surface grinder, I'll show you that later. Next step here is to machine one end of each piece square. Uh, I'm just going to do that by side milling, and then we'll flip it over and we'll cut the other end to length. I've just begun the process of machining all of these parts to length. Now there are five different styles of clamps and there are three different lengths that are required for, to make up the five clamps. So just so I don't get messed up, I've done thumbnail drawings of each of the five with the dimensions on the drawings, the overall length. And as I finish each stack, I put them back on the drawing. So these have been done, these have been done, working on these now. And then I'm putting a tick against the length as I get them completed. Now trust me, <laughs> When you've got this many variables, you're going to screw up somewhere along the line. And I've got two spares. The process for machining these to length is really straightforward. I've got a stop set up here in the vise. I've got a couple of parallels down there. I can just slide the stock in against that stop. I've already got the DRO set to the correct length for this one, which is 55. And I'm going to do a conventional milling pass and then come back with a climb pass, just taking off 0.2 of a millimetre for the climb pass. Three of these fixtures and stops need to have this uh, same rebate cut in one end. And because there are two different lengths, instead of actually setting up uh, for each different length, I put my mill stop on the left hand side against the cutter and I can just put the parts in, mill the slot and not have to worry about setting up for length. Two sets of these clamps have to have this 10 degree angle milled on one end and I looked at all different setups and initially I was just holding this in the vise with a 10 degree angle block underneath it but it was sort of tilting in the vise as I tightened it up it was sort of getting awkward and things were moving and so on so this is the alternate setup I've got a pallet set up in the vise here I set that over to 10 degrees using my digital protractor there and what I can do is slide the stock into this corner formed by these three dowel pins here. So that just goes in there like that. Clamp that down with a toe clamp. I've already set the mill to the correct depth for doing these, so we're just going to machine off this end, the high point here, and that's going to give us a consistent angle. So the actual angle and the depth of the bevel are not that critical, uh, but I just want them all the same. So we'll do that now and we'll go ahead and machine those.
taking very light cuts there because I only had the one clamp, but the dowel pins do give it some support around two edges. While I have this fixture plate set up, I need to drill and tap for M8 in this angular surface here. And uh, in order to drill through that without damaging my fixture plate, I've just put a piece of aluminium plate underneath there as a sacrificial spacer. And what I need to do is to measure either from this bottom corner here or this back corner here. Now I can't quite get at the bottom corner. The larger diameter of my edge finder hits first on this corner here. So I'll use this back edge here. And so in CAD, I'll work out the distance I need to travel from that back corner. And then it doesn't matter which type of clamp I'm doing, that dimension is the same on both the short and the long version. Just in case you're worried about how strong the setup is, so I've put a machinist jack underneath the fixture plate there, and I've got an M6 socket head screw through the bottom of the fixture plate, and the jack is bearing on that. So hopefully it's not going to move. Finish off those threads and device. Just on the last of these parts now, and I need to cut a slot in each one of these clamps or stops. And the slot is size for an M8 socket head screw. And I want clearance in the top there as well for the head of the screw, although the head doesn't go flush with the surface of the clamp or the stop. So what I'm going to do is put this in the vise. I've got an uh, end stop set up here and I've got an 8mm 4 flute centre cutting end mill in the spindle. So what I'm going to do is hand feed through, uh, just using like a, dr a drill bit, and then I'm going to step over 3mm at a time, and I'll use the power down feed on the mill to do those cuts. Uh, when you do the plunge cut to start with, uh, I like to just hand feed that, you get a better sense of what's going on when you do that. But after that, i found the power down feed works really well. Now that I've got that slot cut out to full depth and the correct length, I need to plunge the cutter back down to the correct depth of 16 millimeters and machine back towards my starting point. And that will remove those little cusps that you can see there. And uh, when I'm finished, there'll still be some visible tool marks, but hey, it's a slot for a clamp. <laughs> it's not a part for a rocket ship, so I think we'll be fine.
You can see there's still some tool marks in that surface there, but the screw will still be able to pass one end to the other, so I'm not really bothered about that. I can live with it. Final step on all of these now is to cut the clearance to the head of the screw. So I've got a 14 millimeter high-speed steel two flute slot drill in there and I have to go six millimeters deep so I'll do two roughing passes and a clean up pass. It's sort of a weird cut because when you're in the middle it's a, it's a very interrupted cut. At either end it smooths out quite well and it sounds a lot better. Would probably be better off with a four flute end mill but I don't have one in this size so we'll stick with this. All right, that's that one done. Got a heap more to go. But we'll go next door and put this one on the surface grinder and wind up. Oh man, gotta get a surface grinder. Well, there's a whole batch of steel parts finished to this point. And I did go back and I recut the slot down the centre here and you may recall I said I didn't care <laughs> that you could see those little cusps on the inside but what I realised later on was if you put a socket head screw in there with a plain shank it didn't really fit very well, it didn't slide very well, it was catching so I took about another 0.05 millimetres off either side of that slot there just to allow that to pass freely and slide from one end to the other so it wasn't for cosmetic reasons, it's purely for practical reasons and I just spent the last two or three hours just sort of grinding all these parts or sanding them all, trying to get a reasonably smooth finish on all of the faces. I also deburred all the sharp edges and getting around the inside of this slot, top and bottom, was really awkward. I ended up using a Noga deburring tool, just sort of went around one pass and I was able to clean that up, top and bottom. But getting to the slot down inside the, the counter bore there was really difficult. So what I ended up doing was using a 90 degree countersink bit just as a chamfering tool. And I already had the endpoints set up in my DRO, already had the device centered. So I just dropped that into one end, passed up to the other end and retracted the tool out of the slot there. And that's put a, a nice functional little chamfer on the inside of that slot there. So, those parts are pretty much done. Uh, these need to get parkerized. Now, <clears throat> you can see these toe clamps. I made these about a month ago and they've been sitting on the bench. And you can see the corrosion on the inside of that slot there. And when I parkerize these, they'll end up looking like this little toe clamp here. So that black finish is pretty much permanent. It's very, very durable. And I've never had a problem with corrosion showing through on those parts after they've par been parkerized. So I'm going to do that in the next episode. We'll get all these parts and we'll run them through the, the chemicals to do that. Now, uh, I want to show you what it looks like on the pallet and what we're going to do uh, to finish off these steel parts. So this is what it looks like on the pallet and this is just one configuration you could use for holding down parts. So this is just a toe clamp. Uh, I've got a whole uh, set of those. I think there's five of this size here or seven and I've got two longer ones. But 
this is the, you know, this is what I was doing in this episode anyway, was making these little uh, Mighty Bite style clamps. And uh, when these are both finished, both of these here, you can exert side pressure against a part which is sitting in the, the step there. And then you can mill the top of that um, and without any worry about sort of hitting anything on the surface of your palette. So in the next episode, I'm going to make these brass fingers here. Uh, this one isn't finished, it's too wide, it needs to be machined down to width. Needs to have some grooves cut in one of these angular faces here. And I am going to have a go at making a set of hardened steel um, fingers as well. So uh, these brass ones, I'm guessing they're for softer materials, maybe like aluminium or other uh, non-ferrous parts. But if you were trying to grip a piece of steel really, really tightly, I think you probably need a hardened steel finger for that. So we'll have a go at that. Uh, but uh, I also need to make the eccentric headed screws and uh, we'll do that in the next episode. So that's, that's it for today. I must thank ClickSpring for giving me the inspiration to get on with this project. Uh, it's just another work holding tool set that you can use in your workshop and it sort of just gives you a little bit more flexibility when you're trying to machine parts especially on a pallet like this one here okay so join me next time we'll finish these off we'll do the parkerizing should be fun okay espresso signing out catch you next time cheers So what we have here is an Australian tawny frogmouth. They're a uh, native Australian owl. It's unusual to see one during the daytime though. These guys can camouflage themselves, look like a broken off branch. And when they're in a tree, it's really hard to spot them. He's sort of going into his broken branch mode now. <laughs> they can sit very, very still for hours on end.